And we're back, and we're talking the Samurai Trilogy, directed by Hiroshi Inogaki. Hey, RJ, the first yeah. film in these movies, it won the Best Foreign Film Oscar in 1954. For real? Yeah. Hey, you know what? It also came out in 1954 <laughs> from Toho that this studio Godzilla. put out. And Seven Samurai. What? That, and neither it, this that thing won over Seven Samurai and Gojira? Yep. Mother fucker. Yep. Well, so uh, 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 let's uh-huh. talk let's start somewhere here. Let's talk about Samurai One. RJ's gonna eat some Halloween candy. Uh, as huh? promised. Samurai One, Mushashi Miyamoto from nineteen fifty four. Mm-hmm. Friend Takizo and Madahachi have decided to leave their farming lifestyle and become soldiers. Instead of finding great success and glory in doing that, their side of the battle, uh, Sekigarahara, is routed and they are left to their own devices and kind of uh, fugitives in their own land. On the run from the other army, they wind up shacking up with a widow and their daughter, her daughter. The widow and daughter are in the employ of some resident bandits where they are basically looting the corpses of fallen soldiers and samurai which is kind of also brought up in Seven Samurai, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. Takezo, uh, having a knack for the fight game, kicks some bandit bitches out of there. Uh, Fuck yeah. Takezo's boy, Matahachi, he is misled by the ladies who are both all about Takezo, but they get their feelings hurt and shot down when Takezo turns them uh, down. And now they're telling Matahachi that, that he tried to rape them and try to get in their pants, whatever. And so uh, he's just like, oh, well, I guess uh, we should get out of here. I mean, that guy's a bad dude. Um mm-hmm. So they they take on out they take off. Um, this is of importance just because uh, Matahachi he is engaged to a lady back in their own village named Otsu, and she's gonna be a major figure in the rest of this stuff. Uh, so Takizo he's abandoned. He heads back home, runs afoul of uh, his own village's roadblock. Uh, which is, I guess, preventing uh, bandits and other scumbags from coming in. And he just wades through these people like chumps. I kind of like compared that whole scene to, to like how I play Middle Gear Solid or like other like, oh. like or like World of Warcraft or something where it's like, yeah. oh, I have to like get to this thing. And you just, you just try to run right through, but mm-hmm. usually you die. But he doesn't. Yeah. He, he has great success. Um, yeah, he makes it. So, yeah, uh, well, that, that kind of puts him in ill favor with the village community. And uh, plus, since like their side lost that war, uh, he is now a fugitive. Um, so the whole town's after him for being a piece of crap. Uh, Matahachi's mother thinks that, uh, Takizo's, uh, killed him or like left him to die. And so she's mm-hmm. against him. Uh, Otsu thinks that, uh, he, same thing. Um, Takizo's relatives are rounded up to basically use his bait. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, yep. Then, uh, a Buddhist priest named Takuan, he winds up being the man to capture Takizo. Uh, and this, of course, involves uh, poor Takizo, who I guess I haven't mentioned was played by Toshiro Mufune. Uh, he gets strung up and left hanging off of a rope on a, off a tree for several days through rainstorms, not being fed. Basically, uh, the whole idea is to break him down, to build him back up from being the sort of like wild maniac who's still got some pretty good talent, I guess, behind him with that sword. Uh, Otsu, she can't take this brutality any longer. She just thinks this Buddhist priest or a Zen priest, he's just like a prick. He's just a, a sadist. And so she uh, helps him get down and they're running off to go to a castle. Some hijinks ensues. Takuan uh, tricks uh, poor Takizo into an attic uh, in of this castle, which has no exit, and mm-hmm. just locks him in this room with some books. He is left to his own readings, learnings, enlightenments for three years. I'm not sure how that whole food situation worked out. I was going to uh, say, there was no <clears throat> toilet in there either. Yeah, so things got stinky. But when he emerges, he is bestowed his new samurai name of one Musashi Miyamoto. He takes off, leaving a message for Otsu of AFK. So that is the first movie. Um, Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of background. So uh, this whole movie deal, it is based on the uh, novel, I guess, uh, called Musashi. I guess it wound up being a book uh, by Iji uh, Yoshikawa. 
Uh, it came out, I guess, in Japanese in, in, in a Japanese newspaper in 1935, uh, and it's about the Musashi Miyamoto, who is an export swordsman, uh, Ronin, kind of a, I guess a Renaissance man before the Renaissance, uh, who lived from between 1584 to 1645. But some people think he actually died in 1580. So it's neither here nor there, I guess. No one really exactly knows. Uh, I guess the best way to think about him would be he's kind of like a Wyatt Earp character to America. Uh, he's just like his famous historical folk hero uh, whose life has been adapted into film countless times. Uh, with Musashi, I guess he, he would wind up fighting 60 duels known. Uh, and then uh, after I mean, and he fought these 60 duels by the age of 30 and spent his final years uh, being an artist, sculptor, uh, wrote the his fairly famous book. Uh, book of five rings it's a book of strategy tactics and philosophy which i guess is still used uh in some business circles and martial arts circles um so yeah yeah while killing dudes as legally as anyone ever could he was also a fine artist doing some nice uh i guess ink washes and prints and stuff like that like wood sculptures if uh, the movies are ac- historically accurate mm-hmm um, so RJ, what, what are your thoughts about the first movie? Oh, sorry. I just seen my candy. Um, I think the first movie is pretty good. Yeah. Um, me too. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Um, the first thing I thought was, which was, I thought was really cool was that it was Toho and I didn't know that. So I when think I saw they the have like Toho, such a nice logo, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like when that pot, cause, uh, I'll say very, I'll be very like blunt about it. Well, anyways, it's no secret. I've been really, I was like dreading these three movies because I've been really w- busy with work. And I was like, I don't know when I'm going to fit in any of these things. And it, it, they didn't really interest me at all either. So I was like really not looking forward to them. But um, when that Toho logo popped up, I was like, yeah. You perked I was up. Like, all right. Yeah, I was like, all right, man, Toho. Um, a few like things about the movie in general that I thought were really good. Like all the set or all the um, mo- filming locations were super cool. Like with the mountains and the landscapes and just everything like that I thought was awesome. Yep. Uh, uh, there was like a sequence where there was like um, lightning and there was like, it seemed like there was like filters on the camera. I thought that was really cool too for some reason. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Wh- I don't know what it was. Uh so like just as like things in general, like I, I, I just liked, like I said, like the scenery and I thought the story was pretty solid. And uh, one thing I really like and it's like the series in general, but it's really shown in this first movie is that uh, the passage of time is just like it's assumed that the audience gets that. And so they don't like really belabor the point where it's like. It's like, oh, yeah, time is passing. Like, it'll be one scene, and then the next scene, it'll be, like, two years later. And it's just, like, I think it gives the audience a little bit of credit. They're like, you'll figure it out. Like, so they don't, like, they don't, like, basically have to spell it out that it's like, yeah, this is... This is later. Yeah. Well, especially so, in the second movie, there's a big jump in time between, like, the first scene, even to, like, the next scene. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so like I thought all that stuff was really good. And then there were certain some individual elements I liked a lot. Like there was a lot of uh, there was a scene in the rain and there was a lot of hot abs. Um, There's a lot of diapers and like oh, naked priests. Yeah, lots, lots of Japanese style ginch. Yeah, lots of ginch, lots of ginch. Um, I thought the punishment that uh, Te- Takitsu gets where he gets hung up in a tree for like four or five days. I thought that was awesome. I think that's what we should do now. Yeah. Um, to people, if it was up to me, uh, and I thought that he really deserved it because he was kind of a prick. Uh, like when that scene where it shows him and he just like rides that horse to exhaustion. Mm. Like what an asshole! Like what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, so he was a prick. Um, and that other guy's like so miserable. Like <laughs> he's so pathetic. Oh. Yeah, he could be in your sad bastards list. He is pretty the, uh, sad. The second one more than the first one, but yeah. I thought he was pretty pathetic. Like the he sees his like fiance, and the first thing he says to her is, uh, "Listen, you're engaged to me, aren't you?" And it's like, what? It's like like I know like it's exposition kind of, but I was like, it's such a weird fucking thing to say. It's like, hey, you know you're like my girlfriend, right? It's like, yeah, okay. So, anyways, <laughs> anyways, no, I, I I did like it, like um. 
I thought the story was pretty good. Some pretty cool samurai stuff, but I think the the big the big appeal to this is just like all uh all the scenery, all the like actual nature shots. Like uh, they do a lot of nice like silhouettes with like rivers and trees and mountains and stuff like that. It's wicked. Yeah. So that stuff's all really cool. Um I don't love this movie or anything. I don't think I'll ever rewatch it, but I did enjoy watching it the one time. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um I'll 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 save my comments I guess because they're more like in reference to like the whole trilogy as a whole. You son of a bitch! You just got, uh, you got me to talk about the one movie. See, I didn't even know if you were gonna do one movie or all three, and then you just you pulled the you pulled the wool over my eyes. Oh yeah, I know. I'm I'm a bastard that way. I can't I'm fucking out of here. <laughs> eat your snacks, boy. I'll start read talking about Samurai Two: Duel mm-hmm. at Ishijoji Temple from 1955. The movie opens up with Mushashi facing off against his first of what will be 60 duels. Uh, his opponent this outing is your standard chain and sickle style fighter. We've all seen that before. Uh, needless to say, Mushashi kills the son bitch. The search for enlightenment, enlightenment, I guess, is a past splatter in other guys' blood. The samurai, formerly known as Takizo, makes his way to Kyoto, where his former best bud, Matahachi, and Oko, the daughter of the widow from way back when, are living a decent life. Uh, Otsu is her, Takizo is in Kyoto, and has hustled her way there too. Uh, We're getting a real uh, confluence of characters uh, Mm -hmm. all showing up here in Kyoto. Of course, uh, Mushashi has no time for the ladies on on his bloody path. Um... I guess the the whole bit becomes. Uh, I guess the whole bloody bit thing becomes a point of interest in the film as uh, Mushashi goes to get his sword repaired by a swordsmith who is into the philosophical aspect of the samurai code and sees the sword as part of the samurai soul. And he takes issue with the fact that Musashi, uh, probably my favorite line in the second movie, be, him being a killer dressed as a samurai. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Good uh, stuff. Yep. Uh, Musashi picks up. Uh, he, well, I guess he picks on the uh, Yoshioko school to establish himself as not just your regular Ronin and challenges the master of the school to a duel. Uh, long story short, the master of the school, uh, Shijiro, accepts, but his followers don't want this battle to go down as they basically see his defeat uh, as the end of their school and their like livelihood, I guess, like living on the comfort of being in a school. So they scheme mm-hmm. sort of a large-scale ambush uh, on the usually late-arriving Mushashi. Uh, Mushashi outthinks them by showing up early <laughs> and he gets the drop on 80 men. So it's like, oh, I got you 80 men. I now have to fight. Guys. Instead of like you guys surprising me, I got the surprise mm-hmm. on you. And so, yeah, now uh, we get to see a one on 80 fight uh, through a rice paddy field. Um, and you can see him uh, discover the power of dual wielding. Um, Ooh, which I guess becomes just like in Halo too. Yeah, and I guess this becomes uh, I, yeah. What is it uh, in D and D? I think it's like weapons proficiency, dual wielding, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, something yeah. really nerdy. Uh, and then Mushashi's staple move is the dual wielding thing. It's like Nika Katsu or something like that. I don't know. Finally, yeah, you do. Finally, old Musashi does confront Shijiro, the uh, head of the school, and instead of just killing the clearly inferior fighter, he just leaves him crippled but breathing. What a nice guy. Um, mm-hmm. I guess uh, that's mercy. Musashi, still a bit bloodied and bat- bat- battered after fighting 81 dudes in one go, he gets taken care of sweet stalking Otsu on a lovely soundstage setting. Um, yep. I'll throw out there too that there is some more Matahachi and Otsu stuff and that we get introduced to the final boss of the trilogy one Sasaki Kojiro oh. the baddest ass of them all mm-hmm. and we get to know him as the guy who cannot wait to go sword to sword with Mushashi but that's going to have to wait till Samurai 3 mm-hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on Samurai 2 RJ are you going to pull the same bullshit that you did last time Am I going to talk about this and then you're going to just well, flip it, back? Th- you did a pretty good job of capturing my own thoughts, I think. So okay. uh, you, you just keep going out there. All right, man. I'll fucking do it then if that's what you got to do. Yeah. Um. So whereas I think for the first one where the big pull for me was all like the actual filming locations and stuff like that, this one is the opposite. It's all the sets. Back lots it's and sound stages. Back lots and sound stages. But yep. they look fucking great. Uh, I think I thought all the socks or all the socks, all the all the socks. I thought all the sets looked awesome. Like uh, especially like that first opening set. There's like a pagoda, like a real small pagoda or something, and you got that sunrise or and I don't know. That stuff was all super cool. Um, 
what what else I was gonna say? Oh, there's some some scenes with like snow falling, like later in the rice paddy stuff. I thought that was wicked. Just like really good filmmaking. Um, and then I really like the theme of this movie. So like I had a hard time uh, figuring out which out of the three what I like more. Like I do consider it just one really long movie, but I think one and two are pretty much on par. As almost one of them is the best of the three, I think. But, I agree um, with that. I, yeah, uh, one or two. I I think my I lean towards two, but uh, one is just as good. It depends on what you prefer. Um, but I really like the themes in the second movie. Like it's just a lot of like really petty, cruel people. Uh, everyone is like setting up other people for failures. There's like ambushes. There's corruption. There's like uh those mob there's like uh fuck i saying like a lot uh the school has like like a mob of assassins just going around like killing like the hooded people they're like is that him oh no it's not him and then they run away um so stuff like that stuff was really cool uh so so i don't know and then you see hitachi who's just a huge piece of shit and he's like miserable and pathetic and um, that stuff was really good too. So I think the theme in this second movie is just people suck, life is horrible, and <laughs> everything's against you, kind of. Huh. So I think that's really cool. And then you have some other fun stuff, like the final boss, as you called him. Uh, when I saw him, I wrote down a note, and it said, boyfriend's hairdo, with an exclamation point, because mm-hmm. he has the craziest hair. His eyebrows are like painted on angular, and his hair is – he's got some sort of bob or something like that, which I think is pretty funny. Um, what are some other things? Oh, yeah, Hitachi's playing a real weird-ass guitar when he's all sad. So that was weird. Um, I think the one lady figures out that uh, Musashi Miyamoto is Takizo really – or way too quick for never seeing him or anything just Hmm. hearing stories she figures that out and it's like how could you ever figure that out this guy's (laughs) been like in an attic for three years and then he was like with the monks for some other time after that so i don't know how that lady could figure that out um the rice patty scene at the end is wicked uh i think they show one thing pretty cool where uh well i think one of the things like people might have problems with is that he does take on the huge crowd and he he does it more or less without taking any hits or anything like that but there is one scene where he's like in the rice paddy where it sets up that scene and there's an arrow in the back of his thigh and i didn't even see that happen but the fact that it's there later i thought that was really cool uh and then i don't know there's there's some good lines in this movie like there's one where takizo goes or um, musashi goes to like a temple and the the reading on the front is I think it says uh, respect your deities, do not rely on them or something like that. And I was like, you know, that's pretty good. You should uh, you should pass that out in the real world, maybe. <laughs> so I think that's all I really got to say about this one. But um, I think if I had to pick, I would say number two is my favorite. But I do think two and one are equally as good. Okay. Um, so. Like Actually, one question I had I should have maybe even asked earlier was, uh, what? <clears throat> when did you realize... This movie had Toshiro Mifune in it. Uh oh, it was late. I know. Was late. Okay. Yeah, I I he's, thought he's I like was like unrecognizable. I at first. totally didn't recognize him at the, in the first movie until like yeah. I think I started like looking at the movie like while I was watching it, like just like reading like the Wikipedia thing or something. I was like Toshiro Mifune. I'm like wait, mm-hmm. that's oh my god. So of course like um like my line like lately has been like yeah Toshiro Mifune is like the like Robert De Niro to like Chris Alice, mm-hmm. Scorsese or whatever. But I guess like actually Mifune and the uh, uh, Hiroshi Inagaki, they actually worked together more than uh, Mifune and Kurosawa did, mm-hmm. uh, which is like kind of crazy and speaks to how many movies uh, Mifune was actually in. Uh, um, yeah, yeah I'm, I have his uh, page up right now and he was in 95 movies. That's, that's a lot. That's pretty good considering. I think like, that's more than Abe Vigoda has. <laughs> Let's not get crazy. It's definitely not as much as Klaus Kinski. Yeah, that man did everything for because mm-hmm. he just wanted money. Um, I guess like, yeah, the other thing I'll talk about, too, I guess, is like uh, with uh, uh, Inigaki, the director, I guess he was a silent film actor who uh, 
turned into basically a samurai director uh like in like 1927 or something like that and like he just made like tons of samurai movies uh in fact he mm-hmm. made two mishashi trilogies um he, he two. There, there, there's two yeah he made two trilogies uh there's one like it's like a uh, black and white in the 40s mm-hmm. um and then he made this one which was like him revisiting i'm not sure if it's like a direct remake like beat for beat uh but he also actually did a trilogy about uh kujiro shisake the uh the final boss uh, so he has his own uh, trilogy, and apparently, it, like I guess, I assume it ends the same way because Toshiro Mifune also plays Musashi in that. Hmm. Uh, and there's actually he actually wound up making a fourth film about uh, uh, Kujiro Sasaki uh, in the '60s. And uh, the other thing he made too was he I guess he made the best adaptation of the '47 Ronin story, at least one not starring Keanu Reeves. Oh, I was gonna say I thought it was the Keanu Reeves one. Oh. But no, you're, you also missed one. I think I'm pretty sure that guy also made Footloose. Oh, okay. He's, the the he's, new the new one that came out like two years ago, the oh, remake, not the Kevin Bacon one. Oh, I would have hated to have been on that set. So I, I'm pretty sure that's his uh mm-hmm. his legacy. Yeah. Um, I guess yeah. The, these are just some random notes, I guess. Uh, so do you get the sense that Mushashi's age in these three films, like, because apparently, like, he like had his first duel potentially. When he was like mm-hmm. ugh, 13, or when he went to battle, he was like 13 years old. <laughs> and like, okay, so yeah. Toshiro Mifune, the 13 year old uh, in the first movie, that's why we didn't recognize him. Um, yeah. But then, like, I guess, like, yeah, in the second movie, he's supposed to be like 21. And then, yeah, in the final movie, when, at, uh, at the, the, du- like the duel, 29. Oh, remember, I, thought, oh I, remember, I thought I saw some, uh, some gray wings. On uh, the side of his head. But well, maybe you got to think just back. When, if you were living back in like the 1600s, you probably had a very stressful life with not a whole lot of nutrition, and you probably aged a lot faster. So mm-hmm. there's some maybe something to that, you know. But yes, yeah, that's that's movie magic, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, the one one of the I was watching the uh, uh, special features on the discs, like that's the one interview. Uh, what's the guy's name? It's like it's like a hilarious like generic name. It's like Sean w- <laughs> Close, S- Michael Scott Wilson. So, yeah um so but, not a real mm, person yeah and he was like talking about like there's like this concept of like yeah the shugiosha which is just like the wandering ronin samurai character because basically the idea was that you would wander around and eventually you'd get like uh hired on by a lord and basically become a full-time employee you wouldn't just do this but that's yeah. that's why mushashi's a little different than everybody else mm-hmm. he's all about honing his craft of killing you <laughs> He's about honing in a craft, all right. Yeah. Hey-o. All right. Uh, well, uh, we'll just finish talking a little bit about Samurai Three here, and then we'll mm-hmm. we'll get into some of my thoughts on the movies. Um, okay. So this is Duel at Ganru Island, from 1956. Uh, Musashi is through with this wandering shit. The Shogun wants him as a teacher and vassal. Sasaki Kajiro wants his duel, but Musashi just wants to raise vegetables. Obviously, you can't be raising no vegetables in a samurai movie long before bandits arrive, though. So Musashi gets to do that uh, while he waits a year for that big final duel with Kujiro. Uh, Musashi has grown tired of his killing ways, but it seems Kujiro is just getting his uh, kill and roll on. He takes Musashi's spot offered by the Shogun. Um, he starts building up his own reputation as being a uh, big time killer badass. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the movie's ending. It's like they go off to Ganru Island to have their big final duel. Um, and if you've seen Kill Bill Volume One, uh, the ending is pretty well the same. <laughs> yeah, it's that's the reference. That's Tarantino, and that's that's the end of the movie. You get the big fight on a beach. Um, so yeah, what did you think yep. of the third movie? Um, I think this one's the uh, the least good one of the bunch. Is it because uh, it's the longest? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's because it's the longest. I think it's also because at this point, uh, I just wanted this wanted it to be over. Mm. Um, so I have the least amount of things to say about this one. Because to be honest, like when I was watching it, I was like, no, I pretty much got these movies figured out. Yeah. I was like, I'm fine. Uh, there were j- just a few things, though. Uh, in this movie, I figured out that uh, most of samurai fighting is just shouting and very jerky lunges. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty much what this entire movie is, is two dudes standing off 
one shouts, the other one jerks, the other one shouts, the other one jerks. That's it. So that's what Samurais did, I guess. Um, there's also a girl-on-girl axe fight in this. Hardly. Oh. Yeah. Cat call, kind of. So that's worth mentioning. Um, this one also had the first appearance of a super old monk. Uh, I was... In months, I just missed it because I was bored. Um, but I thought this one was the first one that had like an actual like real old Fu Manchu monk. Like, Ugh. so that was fun. Um, and then just one more scene I'll talk about, and it's pretty. Or actually, one thing I really liked, I did like the sunset silhouette battle at the end. Of course, but it's just beca- of course because it's beautiful because it's <laughs> amazing. Everybody would like that. But um, one thing that I thought was really funny and kind of cool was uh, when. Musashi and his like disciple are in that uh, inn and they're eating and then the guy comes in and he's like I'm a big tough guy here uh, and I didn't hear him say it at first I thought he said he's the uh, the house dealer and uh, Musashi replies horse dealer huh and like it doesn't look up and I thought that was super super fucking funny because I thought he was cracking like a joke like he's like I'm the house dealer and he's like horse dealer huh and I thought it was really funny, but then later I was they were like, Hey, you're the horse dealer? And I was like, Oh, he was a horse dealer. I was like, that's not as good of a joke. Um and then <laughs> there's a scene where like so like he's like trying to intimidate him, and then Musashi's like catching flies with chopsticks. Yeah. Uh and all I could think is, holy fuck, there are so many goddamn flies in that guy's noodles. It's fucking disgusting. When like it free it stops, it pauses on his noodles for a minute, and there's like fucking maybe eight flies in it it's like you got to throw that food out man it is not good so my big takeaway of samurai three is uh, don't eat fly noodles there you have it and that's it okay well my take on the trilogy as a whole because i i think i made a mistake in deciding to watch all three of these movies in one sitting essentially all on uh, yeah, a saturday bad. afternoon um so yeah i'd say that th- these things beat me down pretty hard um, but I mean, I don't know if I'm being unfair, but like, I just like there are average Western movies. I think this is just an average samurai movie. If you want to take it as mm-hmm. like a five hour movie. Um, I've read like people kind of refer to it as like, it's like the gone with the wind of the, of like samurai movies. And I yeah. mean, like, I don't, I don't even know what that means. Like other than it's like, well, yeah, it's got like matte paintings and like sound sets and stuff like that. But, um, and I guess it's got yeah. kind of a love story, but I don't know. Like that movie's like, it's got Scarlet and it's like, and it's got Rhett. This movie doesn't really have any of those things. I mean, I started like, I mean, mm-hmm. are, were you fam- are you familiar at all with like uh, Mushashi outside of these movies? Have, okay. For, first time I heard about it. Okay. So like my knowledge of that, of the man is actually uh Viz uh, put out a, uh, the Japanese manga called Vagabond, which is sort mm-hmm. of like doing the exact, it covers the exact same territory, adapting the um, uh, Mushashi novel, but like kind of, you know, making it more as a comic book sort of thing. And it was like really right. well drawn. And I remember reading like the first few volumes of it, but then I think at the time, like Viz was really bad at keeping things in print. So I kind of just dropped off cause I couldn't get the next few volumes, but I remember being like pretty interesting. And like when I was like reading about Musashi, uh, while preparing for this episode, I was like, this guy sounds so interesting. And like mm-hmm. these movies don't make him seem all that interesting. He just seems like, uh, I don't know. I feel that like if this movie were made now, or like even if it had been made like 30 years later um, or like if it was made now, like this, the style of the, the sophistication of storytelling would be so far ahead of what this was doing. Cause this, mm-hmm. I felt like was very meat and potatoes in presentation. I didn't get right. the sense of like a, tr- uh, uh, a real sense of uh, him being in the pursuit of enlightenment at all. Like it never felt like that was like a driving force for him other than I was being told that was his interest, but mm-hmm. it's just like, it doesn't come off as very earnest. Like this whole idea that, Oh, he gets locked in a room for three years and we don't see any of it. It just transitions out of him, like out of that. And he's fine. He's like all studied up. It's like, God damn it. If that's the point of your movie, it should be like, 
I don't know, the a driving force of like your story to show depict that in some way to so you can like mm-hmm. get into his head and like you get those that beat of him like getting the lights turned on, I guess. Yeah. Um and I was thinking about too, like there's like sort of a uh if you've seen Old Boy, there's like the same thing where like a character gets locked mm-hmm. in a room and kind of forced to like be introspective about himself. Uh yeah. And it's like sort of like so I think that's like a, maybe like a uh, not, uh, not, I guess it's Asian trope because uh, old boy is Korean, but like, I wonder if like how many times that pops up in like stories, um, in that part of the world, if that's just yeah. like a thing or it's like a reference to the Musashi story, I guess. Or, mm-hmm. I, but I think, I don't even know if that's actually something that really happened. I don't think it is. I think it's totally made up. <laughs> yeah. It sounds made up. So yeah. Like, I just, so I don't know, but I mean, it's an interesting idea. I really actually like the idea of that, but it's like, I want to see the movie that focuses on those things and this idea of like a man just going through people, killing them. And like, right. we, we see him do that once and then we hear how he's really good at it offhand and then we see the big battle scene which is kind of mm-hmm. what samurai movies do they have the big fight scene um mm-hmm. but yeah i don't know like there's nothing about this that resonates with me at all i, I, yeah. just, I, just, I just feel that it's like very uh yeah mid- middle of the road um so yep. i was thinking about like com- i mean because i guess you can compare like these uh samurai movies to like uh american westerns and there's um this mm-hmm. one like script writer named frank grubber uh maybe gruber uh he wrote like uh these kind of like his rules of like there's seven kinds of westerns like every western mm-hmm. story is seven stories uh and i, I copy and pasted them here for my convenience there's the union yeah. pacific story the ranch story the Empire story, the Revenge story, mm-hmm. the Cavalry and Indian story, and the Outlaw story, and then there's like also the Marshall story. Um, mm-hmm. For me, like if I go back and look through all the westerns that I feel really strongly about, or even samurai movies, it's always the Revenge story. This movie is not a revenge story at all. Like there's there's nope. not that at all. It's kind of like not a driving force. And I think you need something like that to have that hook. I'm not sure what the uh, equivalent samurai story this one tells because it's basically the story of one man's life and it's sort of a bi- bi- biographical take on it. But <laughs> if I was watching the exact same movie by uh, an American about like uh, an equivalent figure, like in the West, like a white or story told the exact same way. I wouldn't be terribly impressed with it, especially at five hours. Uh, yeah. we, especially in that, the third movie, it is just long. Like that's a whole, like the whole farming thing. It's just like, mm-hmm. it doesn't really pay off to like, it's this is about that duel. You, and you, you mean a uh, discount, uh, seven samurai. Well, far- yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that whole side story. I was just like, so you're just gonna mm. half-ass rip off Seven Samurai? All right, oh, and it, it is so half-ass. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Just I thought I would yeah. add that. Um, there's like the soap opera stuff that just doesn't work. Um, yep. like none. Of, it just it could be it could be done better. Everything, all the things like I don't like about it. It's just because I've seen it done better. Um, it's mm-hmm. done fine, but it's not like memorable. It's not for me to recommend it to anybody. Um. Right. I'm trying to think. So, I mean, things I liked, I guess. So, uh, yep. the priest from the first movie, uh, Takuan, I thought he was great. I love that character yep. in, um, like, uh, Japanese literature whenever I encounter them. It's sort of mm-hmm. like this cruel character that you don't really understand. Or you can't fathom what his instruction is. But then, like, there's sort of like a heavy-handed, oh, it's because he was trying to teach me this. But it's like, is that really the best way you could have taught him? But it's, it's, it's always funny to see that in stories because it's not real. But it's like uh, mm-hmm. something you'd... I don't know. You can gravitate toward. Uh, yeah, sure. I think uh, the Sakura character uh, is really like the best part of the second and third movie, but there's not enough of him, I guess, to drive it. Um, I, I, I don't feel like walking away from those three movies that I took much away from Mifune's uh, performance. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, like he's like it could have been anybody, like, and that's like the weird thing. Mm-hmm. I guess it's like because I mean maybe like a Kurosawa like really played against his type of character by making him do all these like maybe more memorable things in other stuff because like in a I guess in a few episodes we're going to be talking about High and Low which is actually a modern or it's a contemporary story um, and it stars uh, mm-hmm. Otoshiro. Um, it's been a few years since I watched it, but I remember that movie, movie being pretty excellent. So I'm kind of excited about seeing I'll that hold now. You to it. Yes, yeah. Hopefully uh, I'm not lying or my brain's not lying to me. Well, you do lie quite a lot. Um, like you're you're the king of lies. Some people say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as far as like, yeah, I think my note here was like seven samurai is far more interesting technically. Like just like, oh, fuck uh, yeah. well, the, the one thing, okay. So uh, my, I have some little complaints about the Blu-ray set. So I figured that like 
they would have put a little bit more work into the set, but all they have on the entire mm-hmm. d- three DVD or, or three Blu-rays is the like three 10 minute interviews with, uh, Michael Scott Wilson and like, yep. they're fine, but it's like, he's like, so Michael Scott Wilson from uh, what I gather is he's like, he is a biographer on Musashi, which is kind of strange that this like white man is like this, like is more scholarly and known and like, he's the best person yeah. to speak to, but he speaks English and he was probably available. And, uh, I guess, I guess he's a fan of the mm-hmm. movies enough. He wrote a, he, in his essay that's actually in the little booklet that comes with the book, uh, with the movie. Um, he just talks about the book of five rings. Um, so he's like not really super engaged with the movie because it's like kind of like sure. pretty like not true to the facts, I guess. But I don't know what that movie would be like if it were true mm-hmm. to the facts. Um, I will praise though the Stephen Prince uh, essay that comes with the uh, collection. It's like it's really good. I think Stephen Prince is going to pop up a few more times with Kurosawa because he wrote an entire book about Kurosawa. I think mm-hmm. he actually does a lot of future commentary tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, and like his like like his essay has like more information about uh like this movie in Inagaki than like anywhere else that I could find online. I was reading a lot of, yeah. like, sorry, cause I felt like kind of like disappointed in, in myself that I was like, why don't I like these movies more? Like I thought <laughs> I'd like these movies more. And so I started trying yeah. to like read other people's reviews to see if something there would make me click with it, but nothing really convinced me that these movies are like any better than what I think, which is like, they're just mm-hmm. like there, they're okay. Yep. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're just there, man. Yeah, they're just an example of hey, they're samurai movies. But uh, do do I think they're like Criterion level movies, whatever that means? Mm, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, no. Like they're definitely. I mean, there are better samurai movies in the Criterion collection, no doubt. Like we'll be getting to those. Um, and I think I talked about them on the Seven Samurai episode. But yeah, like Sword yeah. of Doom, uh, the the forthcoming release, Lone Wolf and Cub. I think those movies are even better, even though they're like way more like just like there are grim like exploitation movies but i think they're Excellent. like they are like and like boy one thing that these movies were okay one thing that this movie trilogy is definitely missing for a samurai is the violence of people getting killed with swords <clears throat> so yeah uh, yeah that's like a i mean i guess like by the time we get to like something like sanjuro that's when you start hearing bone breaking on the soundtrack and like oh, you, get, you get a little bit more like realism in that regard because even seven samurai isn't quite there yet um, no not yet but, but like uh, like what you're saying too like whenever someone dies in this movie it's like yeah. you see basically the sword pass like in their general direction and then they just fall over that's it yeah no that's it's the most you ever see yeah it's pretty lacking i think stephen prince kind of like tries to defend it saying it was an intentional decision but i'm like yeah mm. I, I, I just think it was not his taste to do something like that he didn't think about it in that way yeah. yet um no the geysers will come don't you worry um <laughs> better i'm taking it out of you buddy They'll it'll come pouring out all over the place. Um, can I can I um interrupt you for a second just to also add to your lack of being impressed with uh this package, this Criterion package? I was uh, very unimpressed with the package, like the literal package itself, mm. um, because it was one of those ones where like it's two DVDs on the same. Uh, same side, side of the yeah. case whereas like all the other criterions i have it's like the dvds have individual spots Booklets. on each yeah. yeah like on each side well so for this one where it was like just like it doubles up like i i don't know it's a weird thing to like dislike but i was oh, i'm fine. so used to everything else or for all the other criterions i have that aren't like that i was like yeah. why'd they make this one like that that's weird yeah, so. no, I, I remember when I actually got my copy in because I I did specifically order it for the for the show because mm-hmm. I figured hey it's samurais and uh, I figured I'd want to get it uh, and um, yeah I don't know it's just uh, yeah the packaging like even like the the drawn art style that accompanies the set it's mm-hmm. kind of like it's okay it, it's like definitely like probably a very it's a very average package for a very average movie boom Ooh, oh shit. Shit. Yeah. I no. Yeah. Something. I agree. Yeah. Like they're they're not bad movies. I wouldn't call them that. But the second, no. the, the third movie is definitely oh, like way too long for what it is. Like it could have easily been like a half hour shorter. In fact, yeah. like yeah. I mean, I think you could probably edit all three of these movies down into something like half the length and probably come up with something pretty cool. It, um, yeah, well, it'd be what, a really <clears throat> solid 
single like two forty five three hour movie. Yeah. I don't know, yeah, I'm not sure like how that would look. I mean, I'd have to actually try doing it to find out if that were true or not, but mm-hmm. it feels like it wouldn't be that far off. Cause I just I don't know. There's like definitely points in the second and third movie where I kind of zoned out honestly. Um, yeah. like where yeah. I was just like, I realized the movie finished. I'm like, Oh, I didn't really write any notes down. And I started thinking back to the movies and I was like, huh, I don't really remember what happened in that movie except for those fight scenes. And there's a bunch of stuff in between. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to see who actually hates these movies. Okay. Uh, uh, I picked a review from one review from each of the installments. All right. Lay it on me. One star by Rembrandt Q Pumpernickel. Mm-mm. shooting your action scenes in one white shot is a good instinct the best action sequences often employ this with hundreds of takes to make everything look both spontaneous and perfect at the same time the camera moves like one of the performers part of an elaborate physical dance but here it is so obviously lazy filmmaking the camera is set up on a tripod and left there sitting regardless of where the action is moving the action seems hardly choreographed at all plenty of people fall over without coming close to being hit and the action seems more like a lazy bar fight than something planned and choreographed This is a pretty clearly an action film, at least extended version of the training sequences of most Kung Fu movies. So why the director seems so uninterested in that aspect of the film is pretty (coughs) mind-boggling. The film isn't only action, but a lot of those same problems still exist in the other parts. It has a very workmanlike feel to it. No angle or cut has a personal or surprising feel to me. About the only interesting thing in this film is Toshiro Mufune, and as other people have noted, he's much better in Seven Samurai, which also gives him a more interesting character arc and way better action, despite not being a traditional action movie. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't totally disagree with some of those points. Actually, I think that, like, it's not even, like, for a one-star review, I mean, I don't even, it doesn't even sound like a lot of disdain. I think my one issue with it is, like, I find people sometimes just, like, say, it looks like it was just shot with a tripod. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that, but, uh, like, I I do think he makes some valid points, but I think, I agree with what you were saying, like, I, I don't think his star rating is fitting with his, and, like, the way he cuts it, like, I agree with some of that stuff, but like, I, I don't think it's a one star movie either. So, no, no, no. Yeah, I've I've seen one stars, and uh, those usually star John Cena or uh, Morgan Freeman's eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll get so to that for Samurai Two. We've got a two two star review by by user Auteur. Mm-hmm. There ain't no drama like a samurai drama because a samurai drama don't stop. While winding up the third hour of director Hiroshi Nagaki's epic snooze fest, I literally could not care less about any of the characters. It, you know what? I will give a tour props for at least using that expression correctly by saying I could not care less. There's yeah. like this weird fucking thing that people do where they say, say, I could care less. Yeah, I could care less. <coughs> it's like, that's like, no, okay, okay you so could. So it's less. not that bad then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this film is 100 minutes of nonstop pronouncements paraded by the cast. Who loves who? Why so and so is not a true samurai? Who will kill who? And who will shame who? With very little to hold your interest visually. For a while, I forgot which color each female character wore, so I had to pay extra attention for key name dra- name drops in their dialogue to figure out which character was speaking. Mm. That's kind of true. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I agree with that. Where, um, but it's not as much for this. Any movie with <laughs> subtitles, I usually. <laughs> don't pay attention to the names and I, I'll, I'll even admit I'm actually pretty bad for this even movies I am paying attention to I, I often like glaze over the names because I have some sort of weird personality dysfunction where I don't I don't pay attention to people's names even people I meet in real life they'll tell me their name and I swear to god 10 seconds later I don't remember it anymore my girlfriend thinks it's because I don't give a shit about anything in life but uh, I think it's just uh, maybe I have a brain uh, impairment. So what I was talking about was that, yeah, I agree with this guy. I, uh, I got lost a lot too on character names, but it was like that one girl wore bells on her, uh, kimono all the time. So I was like, okay, I know that one. She's always got the bells on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. It got kind of confusing with those like time jumps you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to conclude this, um, This is one of the most boring films I've ever seen. It's competently made, like the first one, but that can only get you so far. (laughs) I love love how people write stuff. That's why I read these. I'd say I might give this a second chance somewhere down the road, but that would involve five hours of my life to do it right. And unless the third part is a masterpiece, I don't see that ever happening. Well, 
Well, uh, if you yeah, if he wasn't into the second one, then <laughs> he's got no hope for the series. Yeah, um, I've, but I have seen some people say that the third one's the best. I don't know. They're it's, fucking wrong. It's so sub, it's, I don't know. It's maybe it's subjective, RJ. I don't know. You're subjective. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so this actually, this third review, uh, it's a two star review by uh, a fellow named Mike D'Angelo, who I'm, I'm like, wait, I actually recognize that name. He's actually a like professional film critic. I was kind of like, whoa, two stars for a Criterion film. Uh, He actually gave it 38 out of 100, somewhere along the line. Huh. So, um, just give me a moment here. (coughs) God, Jesus. Man, you you know, you're really spoiling the show with all this bullshit. I've had this this shitty cold for two weeks. I think fans of the show are really going to take notice of this. And, uh, you know, I don't think they're going to jive with what you're doing here. Oh, man. It sucks. It's the it's the life of the podcaster. People can actually start keeping track of how long their uh, uh, makers are sick for. Mm, well, right now you're on for I think three years. I know is what it's going on. So Mike D'Angelo writes: Serious question: Has there ever been a trilogy, bona fide? I mean, not just a film and its two sequels that isn't widely considered a masterpiece? No matter how mediocre some or even all the films may be, people just spoon at the sheer tripticnessy of the whole affair. Excuse me, can you re- repeat that word? <coughs> triptychiness. Triptychiness. Is that a made up word? Well, it's it's a um, well, triptych. You've heard the word triptych, right? Uh, are you speaking Are you familiar Slavic? With, are you are you familiar with diptychs? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to I'm going to consider them as insults and frankly I'm offended. Well, diptych means two things and triptych would mean three things. It's like it's Fuck. a off you need to learn some art history talk to your girlfriend or talk to me art you know what i think is art a sunset a rainbow a beautiful butterfly anyway this mm-hmm. final entry does nothing but stall for nearly two hours as musashi postpones his inevitable face-off with the effeminate rival which again has no emotional undercurrent whatsoever because it's strictly glory seeking in order to go be a humble farmer for a year which despite the presence of some bandits is about as exciting as it sounds <laughs> sunrise duel when it finally arrives is superbly elemental and suggests that inagaki might have been something had he been a stronger judge of material but the series yep. honestly needs harvey scissor hands <laughs> <laughs> to okay. fashion one solid two-hour film from all the largely redundant and or monotonous footage. Oh man! Now there he's com- now he's comparing me to Harvey Weinstein. Fuck! You're you're way thinner than Harvey Weinstein. Yep, that is that is true. Yeah. Oh man. Yep. Well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's I don't know. I don't disagree with any well, of those hate statements, yeah. but I don't hate this movie. Nor would I say it's a two-star like movie at all no but no yeah i i i'm i'm with you on this one where to be honest the people who dislike this movie i actually agree with a lot of what they're saying but yeah i think that they are a lot harsher on it than than needs to be it's like mm-hmm. yeah this they're like oh this movie sucks for these reasons it's one star it's like eh, do you know what a one star movie is let's talk about morgan freeman's eyebrows for a second let's talk you call Lawrence Kasdan and he'll let you know what a one star movie is for real. But no, I, I don't know. I agree with the criticisms, but I think the movies are way better than these people give credit for. Uh, I'm glad I watched them. I will never watch them again. So see, and like, to me, that's kind of like almost the, like a ter- it's a terrible thing for the movie. It's like, for me, it's like for me to be considered good, it has to be like, you'd want to watch it again. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Or, or maybe not. Like, maybe there's like... No, you're... Yeah. I don't know. Like, there's some movies that, like, I've given, like, you know, five stars. Like, amazing movie. But at the same time, like, ugh, do I want to watch that movie again? <laughs> like, because there's, like, some stuff where it's like, yeah, I love that experience. But then I think about it some more and I go, oh, I don't know if I really want to watch that. So, I'm like, is that actually a five-star movie? Would I go out of my way yeah. to, like, tell someone... That, well, like, maybe movies should always be watched at least once. That's kind of my mm-hmm. attitude. Um, well, Oh, speaking of one-star movies, I, am actually, I just pulled up my uh, ratings. Um, John Carpenter's The Ward, his last feature oh. film. Yeah, that's a piece of crap. Uh, so oh, there you go. There bad. you go, John Carpenter. I uh, yeah, I haven't seen that one yet, but I'm <laughs> I'm a big supporter of uh, Mr. Johnny C. So, well, it, just it, don't watch it, The Ward. Just don't. Okay. Don't that's watch fine. Halloween Five. Oh. Don't watch Red he, Sonia. Oh. Don't watch Free Jack. Oh, you're just naming movies now. Don't watch Proxy. Some people might try to tell you that Proxy is a really great horror movie. 
it is not good at all. It is horrendous. Wrong turn. One star from mm -hmm. this guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah. Anyway. Oh, it's Steven Seagal movies. Just stay away. But he's a jujitsu master. Uh, yeah, until, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, LaBelle choked him out and he shit his pants. And he pooped his pants? <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's a perfectly um, biological response to uh, going unconscious. Yeah, that's what happens. But when you're talking about how you're a badass, um, when you get choked out by an old man, uh, that's how it goes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yep, yep, yep. That wraps up uh, another discussion about the Steven Seagal and the Steven Seagal podcast. Steven um, Seagal. Yeah. We're coming uh, for you, buddy. Yep. Yeah. And uh, stick around and uh, we'll promote some shit at you.